Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back to the final session. Uh, we've talked about we talked about the history of Ethernet and wasn't that fascinating. We've talked about where Ethernet fits into everything. We've talked about where Ethernet is today. And now we're going to talk about the future of Ethernet. So without further ado, as has been said before, let me ask David Newman from uh, Network Test to come down and tell us something about that. David. Thank you, and good afternoon. We're going to have a stellar on this session to discuss where we're headed. And one of the things we've been hearing all day is that this question of what is Ethernet. So although we'll be talking about the future, I thought we'd begin by talking about where, where we've been and what that might tell us about where we're headed. So with apologies to the panelists, uh, any panelist who's going to boldly predict that Ethernet will get faster. Here's the, here's the rate track for Ethernet. And it's a good example of the way that Ethernet keeps reinventing itself, where the original Ethernet ran at about 3 megabit. And today we've got 400 gig Ethernet under, under study in the IEEE. And every new generation of Ethernet that comes out, the old generation is a rounding error compared with the new, the new version. In fact, that was the joke among Ethernet's in, uh, inventors, was that the old 56K lease lines that Ethernet replaced at Park, that was literally the rounding error between the nominal, uh, well, the, the nominal three gigabit, three megabit rate, and the actual rate of 2.94. And so there's been this steady and exponential progression in rates. So to the question of what is Ethernet, we cannot describe it in terms of rate alone. So click, click. If we can't describe Ethernet in terms of rates, what else can we say about it? The original Metcalf and Boggs paper described Ethernet as a system of local communication among computing stations. Well, we've had Metro Ethernet for more than a decade, and there are some WAN implementations as well. So that's out. When I was a young network manager, I often heard Ethernet dismissed as a science project. And I was told I should go learn serious network technologies like Token Ring or something else, because that would be the corporate standard. And then, as we all know now, Ethernet pretty well trounced Token Ring, not only Token Ring, but pretty much every other competing technology. So that's out. Service providers used to complain that Ethernet was somehow not good because it was unmanaged. Today, those same service providers are busy implementing Ethernet OAM, so that's out. Other network managers used to complain that Ethernet was somehow not good because it was somehow not predictable or not reliable. Today, we have things like resilient packet ring in the WAN, in priority-based flow control in data centers that give us very reliable, very predictable service levels over Ethernet. So that's out. And this final point comes already struck through. Ethernet was never expensive. It's always been cheap to build, cheap to implement because of its simplicity. And that brings me to a word that is intrinsic intrinsic to the past, the present, and I think the future of networking. That word is money. Uh, Bob Metcalf, before he moved to Texas, lived in a very grand six-story townhouse in Boston. And he often had students over to visit. And the students would walk around this great house all glassy-eyed and go, wow, I've got to work really hard to invent something really cool so I can live in a house like this. And Dr. Metcalf would tell them, you don't understand. I don't live in this house because I invented Ethernet. I live in this house because I learned to sell Ethernet. So I'll just put up this quote that no engineer likes to see. But the fact is that financial factors have always been a part of driving the history of networking forward. And although we'll have a lot of technical talent on our panel today, I'm hoping that we'll discuss both technical and business drivers when we consider what's, what's to come next when we look at Ethernet. 
So with that, I'd like to ask our panelists to come up now. Oops, sorry. And please join me in welcoming them up. They are Faraj Alai of Aquantia, Stu Bailey of Infoblox, Glenn Edens of Park, Bruce Davey of VMware, and Shazad Merchant of Gigamon. Welcome all. So I'd like to start off by asking each of the panelists to give us a very brief one to two minute introduction on his view of what's, what's interesting and what's new uh, in, in networking and where we're headed. Then we'll open up the panel to some discussion and we'll finish up as with the other panels with a Q&A session from the audience. So let's start off uh, immediately to my right. Bruce, with you, if you'd like. Sure, so um, I, I think the there's obviously a lot of things I could say about the future of networking, but the one that is really uh, pressing for us right now is the virtualization of networking that came up in some of the earlier sessions. And as you, if you know anything about VMware, you probably know that VMware really made a business out of uh, server virtualization and interestingly didn't invent it. It was invented, I think, by you know in the, back in the 70s at IBM, but VMware made a business out of server virtualization. And the, the piece that's really been missing for, the, I'd say, the last well, I guess, you know, as long as there's been server virtualization is an equivalent technology for virtualizing networks. And so that's the, the big thing that we're working on now uh, is trying to make it possible to create and manage networks that are created in software and can be, can be provisioned in seconds just the same way you can create and provision applications in software today, running them in virtual machines, separating away the network services from the underlying physical hardware. So it's this separation of network services from hardware and speeding up the provisioning time that network virtualization enables. So I think I've used my minute. I'll leave it at that for now. At Park, uh, we're working in a number of network technologies, uh, hopefully in the tradition that we started, um, but it's a tough thing to live up to for sure. Um, one of our most significant projects is around content-centric networking, which is focusing on what would a network be if content and its name and how you get it is more important than machine addresses. So we're working on a set of technologies um, that basically explore that space. We've done a number of very interesting proof of concepts uh, in the area of content distribution networks and some other applications. But it's pretty interesting to imagine an internet where you didn't have source and destination addresses and you really concentrated on the, uh, well, I understand, for, uh, well, you concentrate on what we kind of think is the primary use of the internet until I understood it was about shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stu Bailey. Um, so we're a little bit unique Infoblox. We're actually a, a public company that for 10 years, more than 10 years, has successfully sold independent software into the networking business. So that is traditionally just not true about networking. You buy, you sell a box, it does something. And because of the work of the people in this room, and what James Walker uh, mentioned in the panel earlier, uh, Ethernet really is ubiquitous. And so that changes the potential economic model for this hardware-defined networking industry, which has served us all very well. But that paradigm shift, which means that really an independent software market could emerge in networking, and that the center of value as it did, as we transition from the mainframe to the PC server, the center of value shifts from hardware to software. That seems fundamental. And so as, a, as an independent software vendor, one of the few in networking, we're very focused on how that will uh, transform over the next few years. I am uh, Shazad Merchant uh, from Gigamon. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to the organizers for setting up a fantastic event to celebrate 40 years of Ethernet. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with uh, all these people here. It's interesting, if you think about the future of networking, to really look back a little bit and try to see what's changed over the last couple of decades and what has not. Right? So if you look at what's not changed over the last couple of decades is the fundamental nature of networking still, I think, by and large, stays the same, which is you have network equipment that is still vertically integrated. Right? You've got hardware, you've got silicon, you've got control systems, operating systems, application stacks, all coming from the same vendor. 
And I think as you look to the future, the first thing we're beginning to see is that vertical disaggregation. And I think that will give rise to a tremendous opportunity to innovate, where you'll have a set of vendors providing hardware, and there'll be innovation happening there, uh, a different set of vendors providing uh, the control plane software, and there'll be innovation there, and then another set of vendors providing applications, and there'll be innovation there. So that's, I think, a tremendous opportunity. Now, if you look back and say, what does all of this require? I think this is going to give rise to a completely different kind of a network, a network that is going to be critical for instrumentation, for visibility into what's going on. Right? As you take these different layers and try to figure out, how do I troubleshoot this? How do I manage this? Uh, how do I instrument this? Uh, it's giving rise to a new kind of a network called a visibility fabric or a visibility network. This network's very different from how silicon is designed today for traditional networks, which is address-based forwarding. Right? You take a packet, the address, you send traffic. When you start thinking about instrumentation and visibility, it's a very content-based forwarding paradigm. So it reflects what was just talked about, right? I think there will be a growing need for a content-based forwarding, particularly when it comes to instrumentation uh, and manageability uh, uh, as the network disaggregates, so to speak. So I think that's a tremendous opportunity moving ahead. Hi, my name is Faraj Lai. <clears throat> First of all, I'm going to yield most of my time to you because you're going to have a wonderful conversation going on here. But um, the one thing that I can say for certain throughout this panel is everything these gentlemen are going to talk about is going to have to ride on a physical layer technology. And that's what our company does. We build 10 gigabit Ethernet over copper, 10 GBHD. Our goal as a company is to keep moving the legacy of Ethernet forward. Um, there is uh, a phenomenal number, about a billion ports of gigabit Ethernet that ships every year. Our goal is to convert all of those gigabits to 10 gig Ethernet so that every consumer can have access to that broadband uh, Ethernet flow so they can exchange their movies and uh, whatever traffic they have. Okay, great. Thank you all. So we've heard some differing visions here about um, there's consensus that we're moving more toward a software-based model of networking and maybe some differing versions about the software-hardware split. So let me start off by asking anyone on the panel, um, what are your views as we move to this more software-based world? What are your views on how that affects the installed base of Ethernet hardware that's out there? And how does it affect uh, new Ethernet or new network implementations, be they virtual or physical? Any, anyone? Everybody's looking at me. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I've learned I have to be very careful because at VMware we partner with almost all the hardware companies, so almost anything I can say can be taken um, to offend somebody that we work with. Um, but, speaking for yourself. Yeah, <laughs> speaking for myself. Um, I think that the uh, that you know, clearly as we start putting more of the complex services into software, that means that there's a focus on different things from the hardware than has been the case in the past. I think it used to be that you looked to get all of your complex services from the hardware and you would compare one box against another based on the complexity of its feature set. Now I think it's going to come down to more about how easy is it to manage that hardware, how resilient is it, um, you know, how, how, how well does it self-provision itself. So this, uh, as uh, you know, was said a few minutes ago, the hardware continues to be critically important, but I think the set of things that people are going to use to evaluate hardware will change away from complex features and more towards things to do with manageability and resilience and performance. If I may uh, jump in real quick, uh, I fully agree. I, I think you know, what we're really looking at here is a paradigm shift. Right, uh, where, uh, where this disaggregation happens and people are focusing on software and you know, control planes and there's always going to be hardware as well. Uh, but a paradigm shift typically uh, is embraced when it is easy to embrace it. Right? And, and you need, what I would say is you need tools, you need instrumentation, you need visibility into every layer of the stack as you think about this paradigm shift, right? Any new technology uh, is, is significantly, and the adoption of any new technology is uh, significantly enhanced if you have the ability to troubleshoot it and to manage it, right? So I think as we look at this vertical disaggregation, as we look at applications and a greater emphasis on software, the ability to look into that, to look into uh, the applications, to look into the control planes, to get a look into the physical networks uh, uh, will, will be pretty, pretty uh, critical uh, in enabling that disaggregation. Yep. So <clears throat> our, our perspective, we're software people. So we're not, we're not hardware people. 
Um, and in fact, I brought some props and it was, I was very worn, like you cannot bring any products. And it's easy for us because we don't sell any networking gear. But you um, hardware. Right. Yeah, this is not hardware <laughs> we would thing. sell. Someone um, else's hardware. Yeah, That's someone okay. else's hardware. Yeah. We won't tell who it is. Um, and Infobox doesn't sell um, hard packet processing stuff. Um, we sell software. Sometimes we ship it on a white box server, but it's not packet processing stuff. But I'll tell you what excites us. Um, this is a just off-the-shelf box with one gig Ethernet ports, and with software, I can turn this into what's called an open flow switch. And if you're not familiar with open flow, that's very exciting for us software people. That is a way to turn this white box after it's been deployed remotely uh, into either a firewall or a load balancer or a router or some combination of those things that's actually tailored to a business need. And this is like four ports of Ethernet. You can buy it off the shelf uh, um, and it's uh, giggy and it's uh, 400 bucks. <laughs> and we assume that price will only get better. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Raspberry Pi but this is a $35 ARM processor based uh, uh, board, 35 bucks retail, and it comes shipped with on it 100 megabit ethernet. So again, thank you to everybody in the room. Um, and you can put a Wi-Fi uh, card on the USB. Uh, you can put more than one. So now I have more than one network port. And for me, I'm a software person, we're software people, I don't know what's really going on underneath the cart, but it looks like Ethernet to us. Exactly what was said in the last panel, the frame is what's important to us. So now we have two, switch, two pieces of hardware, which are Ethernet data planes, and remotely, at any time, I can change the packet processing functions in those data planes, and that is fundamentally with software using OpenFlow. So now that Ethernet is ubiquitous, OpenFlow becomes a standard for software-focused people to you know, imagine 10,000 of these switches. Now, as a software person, I have a standard way without touching the hardware to turn these into any kind of box function I'd like. That seems fundamental to us, and we think that's fun that will be increasingly fundamental to our customers because it just changes the economics. If I may, I, I think Perhaps. that's a fantastic point you bring up, uh, Stu, right? I think as we start thinking about software and programmability, right, another aspect which is adjacent, but I think equally important, is the notion of programmability. Right, and uh, I think that's going to be pretty critical as we think about evolution or discontinuity in the way we think about networking. Uh, you know, one of the things, again, if you look back, one of the things that has not changed over the last decade, two decades, is, is the kinds of APIs that are available for network developers. How many over here are familiar with APIs like Get Time of Day? Anybody written seek? There you go. Right, uh, Get Host by Name. Right? People still think in terms of IP addresses, MAC addresses, right? And that paradigm hasn't changed over the last several decades. So I think there's an opportunity as we uh, think about a more software-centric networking uh, for content-rich APIs, right? And what I mean by that is the network sees it all, right? You have visibility to who the users are, where they are, what they're doing, when are they getting on the network. But that information is not easily available today. It's all IP addresses, MAC addresses. But if you can start thinking about content-rich APIs, get user by name, things like that, I think you have a complete paradigm shift in the making over here. So that brings up an excellent question for Glenn and, and, and for whomever else as well. Um, how, how does content-centric networking change the model? How does it use the existing addressing model? Everyone needs a name. And how do we get away from that, or, or do we get away from that? So there's a couple interesting factors. Um, it is possible to build a CCN-based network or a content-accessible network 
without any IP addresses whatsoever, and, and we proved that. Um, you basically get into some interesting discussions on how you route on names, but the key thing is you're dramatically increasing the flexibility of routers by making them um, include a great deal of memory. Um, so distributing caching and distributing computing into the router are the really key elements to running a large-scale content-centric network. One of the things that happens is you, you, you change the kind of processing you do. Um, rather than worrying about how quickly you can um, map addresses through address tables and content addressable um, memories and cut through on a router, you need to worry about a lot of different things. Um, you still have packets and you still have frames, so that part of Ethernet lives forever. Yeah, I, I say, I think it's so exciting because really very appropriately and very successfully we've been on this track for I don't know 15 plus years for internet style networking in terms of networking in the whole and with the with ethernet being ubiquitous we really open up the design space for solutions at a cost that makes sense and it really means wow we can really rationally think about deploying whole new applications that we might have only been able to glimpse uh, at, you know, when a, a, you know, Ethernet ruined my ATM network. That's, that's one way to think about it. Only because it was so cheap and available. So some of those design spaces and networking are really opening up to us uh, in a fundamental way. I think that's very ex exciting. Yes, Faraj. Yeah, somebody said earlier that uh, the statistics are that uh, there's now more Ethernet equipment sold than all the other... Sonnet, SDH, all of the other ones combined. <clears throat> that fundamentally, from a network perspective, creates a problem when you're, you're talking about a software-defined network or a network that has a different control plane from data plane, whereas everything today has got them all bundled up, right? So where the value comes in in these types of networks is when you're building large networks, not a little one. If you're building a large network, by definition, you're going to have some legacy type products involved in there. So, you know, I, I, the way I see, and again, I'm not a software, um, software guy by, by training at all, I'm more of a harder guy, but um, everything that we're talking about has to take place in the context of an evolutionary plan and one that takes into account the limitations of the existing system and the existing silicon and the existing you know, hardware that's out there. It's, it's just, it's not going to turn over into a, you know. Well, it sounds as if there's consensus on the panel that this is not an either or question, yeah. that, that although Definitely there's a not. software model, although there are new content, content centric models, say that three times fast, yeah. uh, that, that actually may end up selling more hardware, not less, in the long run. Would you, would you agree? Absolutely. I, I mean, the key challenge is going to be wire speed and wireless speeds are increasing. So there's always been a push to do any network processing at wire speed. So in the future, if you start talking about higher level functions, content lookup, caching, error recovery, security, how are we gonna do those at wire speeds? Part of that is gonna be a question of where does computing technology go, but part of it's gonna be about the layers and the architecture. Absolutely, I'm, just to interject on that, I'm, I'm a performance test guy. And I remember many years ago when Mick Seaman was CTO of 3Com, and he had this saying that performance goes away as an issue when it's wire rate, period. And I think I think there was actually, software that's going to be an interesting challenge. Yeah, I, I think I, I do want to uh, come back. I think there was a very important point that that you just raised, right? And I think it's a very valid one, right? Which is, you know, all of this has to work at scale, right? This is not about taking 10 ports, 20 ports, 100 ports, right? This is about taking tens of thousands of ports. Uh, billions and, making and billions. It, what's that? Billions and billions. Billions and billions, right? And, and making it work. And, and I just feel, right, when you start looking at, uh, you know, a controller-oriented model, right, I think there are tremendous advantages to that. But we've got to be also a little bit forward-thinking in terms of what would it take to troubleshoot that kind of a network, right? Because if you don't have that, if you don't design that into your network, uh, you're going to run into challenges, right? So as you think about that paradigm shift, as you think about a software-oriented network, a centralized controller-oriented model, you've got to start thinking about what kind of instrumentation do I need for that? How am I going to troubleshoot that? How do I tap into that network and extract the relevant data? 
you know, imagine the controller programs certain things in the switches, and it thinks the switches have those flow entries, but the switches are doing something else. How do you troubleshoot that, right? At tens of thousands of ports, right? And I think bringing visibility into all of this is going to be very critical. But so, sorry, I, I, um, unfortunately, I've got the time beam monkey on my back. Um, I wish we could discuss this for about three more hours, how we're going to implement all these different things. But it's time now to, to turn to questions from the audience, if there are any. Mm -hmm. See hands going up here. It's uh, Bob Emerson again. Um, when I first heard about uh, software-defined networking uh, from uh, Dan Pitt, he was describing commodity boxes like you've just put on the table there and the IT guys. It's so simple, they can set the whole thing up themselves and, you know, it's the end of the big Cisco switches and, and the Junipers and all the rest of it. He didn't actually say that. And then later on, it seemed that it wasn't the end of the big switches and the big routers and so on. But what strikes me, <coughs> Stu, is that if you've got a sort of an SMB, which is global, and they are, lots of them, that they could use these little red boxes and configure the whole thing themselves, and the only service they need to buy is a connection between the boxes. Does, does that make sense? Uh, I think that makes sense. I mean, I'm not... so. I think your question is, well, how does it impact the market and the and the bigger box vendors? Was that your okay? Mm -hmm. So maybe I didn't understand your question. Sorry. Sorry. The real question is, uh, sorry about that preamble. Is is could an SMB? It was international. Got offices around the world. Oh. Just get these red boxes and uh, configure them themselves. It's easy. It's in software, and uh, all they need between the boxes is straight connectivity. They don't need any real service from a service provider. Yeah, I think if you have a programmable, uh, uh, a remotely programmable standard interface like OpenFlow, absolutely, absolutely. That and that really changes the economics. So now, you know, you say, look, if you're going to sell the hardware, you're in a low margin, high volume business like the server business, and if you're going to sell the software, it means your software can run on any of the hardware. So you're really in the software business. So I think that your use case is absolutely a potential. Um, with a standard like OpenFlow and with the ubiquitous nature of Ethernet and the falling prices in compute and, and switching. So, you know, um, not only is it possible, I think it's inevitable for that kind of model to happen. I just want to jump in. I think there is a, a really important role for the, the software there. I don't think SMBs are going to be writing their own software to control open flow switches, right? There's, there's got to be a okay. layer above that that's going to be written by, you know, companies that, that, that provide that yes. level of abstraction. I think it's a huge, yeah, I, I don't want to miss this point. I think the most exciting thing about, you know, software-defined networking and emergence of a standard like open flow is that exactly right. The SMBs aren't going to write their own code. They're going to buy the software from somebody, which means for the first time in history, there's an independent software market in networking that doesn't exist today. So now you're going to see you know, software savvy kids coming out of college with white boxes and applications that we can't even imagine in this room filling a market need that we might not have uh, even good visibility today, but may be just around the corner. So we're in that exciting chicken and egg phase that we, uh, you know, many experienced in the emergence of PC and client server as it moved away from a hardware-centric mainframe and mini computer market. So we've got time to slip in one more quick question. I think there's a hand here. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Sean Hackett from uh, 451 Research. So this is a very interesting panel. I thought one of the most interesting thing was I thought I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, VMware talk about resiliency of the hardware. Um, you know, you've made a business out of abstracting hardware, right? I mean, it's because of, you know, it's because of VMware and other, others that we've moved, I think, to this world of, you know, sort of the software resilient data center, right? I mean, Microsoft just built a huge facility, almost a billion dollars with no generators. Right, because the software and because of VM VM mobility, I can just you know move VMs around, and all of a sudden I abstract the hardware. This has huge implications for the network, and I'm shocked no one's really talked about it. I mean, it's no longer you know network traffic going up to a top of rack switching out; it's east-west traffic, right? 
What does that do to think, you know, I know there's a number of questions here, but what does that do to spanning tree? What about trill? What about, I mean, you know, so I'd be interesting, I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, what your how, take how is on all that. How much time do you have? Yeah. yeah. I know. Well, so, uh, since, since you, you mentioned sorry. VMware, and I, I did use the word resiliency, I just want to say clearly what, I'm, what I mean by that. We, we really, we depend on there being connectivity between the servers, right? I see the, 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 the functionality of, you know, of networking software moves into the vSwitches running in the hypervisors. You know, that's how you get scale and performance by putting those complex functions at the edge. That's how you abstract away from the underlying hardware. But you still want the hardware to get the packets between the servers. Any one router or switch perhaps doesn't have to be resilient, but the overall switching fabric of the data center certainly has to be resilient, and that means things like fast failover when a link goes down, whether that's done through fast convergence of your IP routing protocol or some proprietary thing like you know, fabric path or whatever. So somehow the, the, the data center fabric has to be resilient. And you know, so we, 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 but just like we don't depend on any one server to stay up forever, we don't depend on any one box to stay up, we depend on the overall network to, to stay up. And that's, you know, I, I do want to make sure that we realize the hardware vendors still have a job to play here because uh, we depend on them. But just like uh, redundant arrays of disk drives completely changed the storage industry, I think a lot of the responsibility for creating a network that is completely resilient should really happen at the higher levels. Moving from one data center to another, uh, using content-centric like protocols is one way to do it. There's many others. Um, I think a lot of those issues can be moved up because wireless in itself is a, a not a friendly environment for packets either, and yet that works, but it's done above. So although we're moving into the software sphere, clearly, um, it seems that we, we agree that, that it is yet one more overlay giving us applications that we're thinking about now, applications we haven't thought about yet, and Ethernet is still there as a constant. So I want to thank all of our panelists for a provocative discussion. I wish we could go on a lot from here. Thank you.